Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. It is Tuesday night. It's Tuesday night and it's cheese night. It's cheese night. Now, I'm so excited about tonight um, for purely personal reasons. Uh, I'm on a diet and, and, and I'm allowed out of my diet to eat cheese. So not only do I obviously love cheese in a general and completely awesome way, uh, but this is like my only meal of the day. So I am on it. Right. Uh, cheese night, cheese night. What's our subject today? Our subject today is stinky cheeses. Stinky cheeses, the washed drying cheeses. And what better place to go than going to look at the foot of Ireland? Now, Irish cheese making is amazing. Um, they have some of the most awesome pastures in the whole of Europe, and they have been dairy cattling for uh, thousands of years. Um, but in the foot, I don't know if you ever looked at Ireland. It looks like a kind of a koala bear, um, and it's foot the bottom paw. There's a little place. Uh, down about there's some peninsulas down there in the county of Cork and we've chosen uh, thanks to Sheridan's to have a look at three awesome cheesemakers part of the Irish cheese renaissance, renaissance very like our uh, across the channel British Bristol channel cheese renaissance uh, brilliant cheesemakers Malin, Gubbin and Duras and we're going to look at those where they're on the map in a second but in the meantime let's get Tracy she's going to pop in do all the admin stuff, which I'm so terribly bad at, and bring on, say hello. So, hello, Tracy. Are you there? I'm here. Hello, everybody. Happy hello, Tuesday night. night. <laughs> um, Are you well? Got... Have you had a good week? Yeah, good week so far. It's only Tuesday, so we're still trucking along. Um, we're very pleased that we've launched Watch Again British Cheese Weekender. So, all those awesome videos that went over the three days of the early May bank holiday. We've managed to rescue, how many is it? Uh, 25 of them, 26 of them. Um, some, of the, some of the presenters, bless them, they're better at cheese making than at um, tech and videoing. So we've lost a few. Um, yeah. You mean you've, you've lost the videos? Yes, they, they, they went into the ether on the night of the... This is not the 1950s BBC. <laughs> this is modern world. Come on. Well, I think they were concentrating on their, um, on, on their amazing knowledge and, and, and showmanship on the night. So, okay. um, cool. Well, we were lovely to have the moment and some things just have to be consumed and Memory molecules only, so uh, that's the way it is. But you've got 26 for us to watch, and you're going to be shouting about them. That's good. It was a great success, that. We were very pleased. Yeah, we um, amazing amount of people got to see it. We had a recipe from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, which carried it on on the Sunday onwards. And the, many of the cheesemakers are back up and making. Um, so that's great. That's what we wanted it to do. Sorry. Good news. Um, so, of good news stories, Tracy. I understand you will be a grandmother shortly. Is that right? Yeah. Um, my eldest daughter is due in a week tomorrow, so Ooh. I may be leaving. Your bag packed? <laughs> Sorry. Is your bag packed? Uh, not yet, but I've. I'm. I know what I need. It'll be fine. I don't think she'll need me. <laughs> She's very confident. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. Well, let's get back to some of your cheese. Um, I want to start tasting these in a second. But let's talk about a bit of training so that people know where to find the best cheese knowledge in the world. We've got our e-learning coming up. And we've got, not only am I doing my webinar courses, uh, which the next one starts on the 1st of July, I think. Um, but uh, we've got Patrick McGuigan coming online to do webinars and Canico. And mm -hmm. she is reaching out to the good people of Japan. So she's going to be teaching Japan cheese from London. Is that right? Yeah, sure. So she's going to be teaching. Um, she's she's doing some master classes to warm up um, with the Japanese um, retailer, Cheesemonger in Japan. But she will be training the level one courses in uh, the Academy level one course virtually um like you're doing as a webinar um to people in the uk or in japan and she's she's fairly bilingual so she'll teach it in japanese and english so um you can learn a little bit more um english if you are japanese so very exciting and brilliant because 
We still haven't managed to get the classroom courses back, obviously, yet. Um, yeah, we'll watch that, Boris, though. He'll have us doing it by the end of the week, though. You know, it's all going to go wild. Uh, well, and, and Patrick's going to do it. I don't know where Patrick is at the moment, but um, I'm very competitive with you, Panic Patrick. My courses are better. Just saying, you know, <laughs> and refute that if you like, but I'm better than you are. Right. <laughs> Tracy, yeah. anything else you want to say before you let me get on to the to, to the, the, the good people of Cork's wonderful smelly? This is aroma coming up here right now. I bet, I bet you'll bet your wife's really happy and your children, your girls, with all the smells from that fridge. No, yeah. go for it. Let's try right. um, some cheese and hear all about these wonderful Irish cheeries. Oh, I know what I do need to say is Avril Malloy, who we've got two training partners in Ireland, so Avril is the Irish School of Cheese. And she's telling me about, um, there is a wonderful uh, Irish interactive map of Irish cheeses. Let me just give you the website. In fact, I'll post it up in the chat. Um, it's uh, irishcheese.ie and it's an interactive map of all the Irish cheeses. So that's fantastic. And then our other training partner in Ireland is Sheridan's. So we're just waiting on the classroom courses coming back and mm -hmm. then those classes will be carrying on in Ireland. Okay, so over to you. I've got, I've got the Sheridan's book here. I love that book. I have to say, it's bloody good. It it's is. Really bloody good. Um, I have been uh, doing a bit of my research on it and that kind of thing to make sure that I'm not going to talk complete manure all the way through this little 30-minute 30, 30 session. Um, but so recommended. Kevin and Seamus. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, it's lovely to see you and good luck. With your, with your, with your grandchild, grandchild number one. Okay, let's talk cheese. I've see we've got some nice people there. Hello, Claire. Hello, Alison. Alison, I got your. Let's see if we can do that beautiful cheese board from Neil's yard, which I'm looking at now. I can't make appear on my screen. We've got some Coulier, awesome cheese. We've got some Cashel Blue, which is one of my awesome favourites uh, of the blues. Soft, Mr. And Mrs. Grub. We should, we should feature that. It's great cheese. Uh, and uh, you've got some of this which is the gabine as well. There we go. Can you see that, people? Wow, look at that cheese. This is an amazing character. Come on, you can focus. There we go. We're seeing some focus now. Now this, it's like it's like a thick coat he's got on there. Now, let's talk about Ireland, uh, but I want to taste first. So the Irish have awesome pastures, okay? That's really what sets they grow them apart in terms of dairy and they've gone they've got a fascinating history fascinating we'll touch on it in a second but um it basically goes back neolithic times now neolithic is sort of six and a half thousand years ago maybe a bit more it depends it basically is that tipping point by between when we go from uh stone age into metallurgy the bronze age and iron age and that happened in different parts of europe at different times um, but we were seeing in ireland dairy farming back then and where there's dairy there is cheese all you have to do is let a pint of milk go off cheese brilliant and that dates back to the time when you were putting curd in strain there's little pots with holes in and that kind of thing but they would have been using not just pots they'd have been using reeds to make the strainers so ireland has a very old history of cheese making but as we'll discover, it went a bit sideways. Okay, S number one. Okay, we're going to do these in uh, no particular order except for what I'm going with alphabetics. I'll start with Duras. Now, Duras cheese is a uh, is an all three of our washed rinds. Now, this one is sort of, I think, this one I've got here is closest uh, from a I don't know French perspective, I suppose, to the Machoile of northern France, the Nord Pas de Calais. Right, can you see that? What we've got here is that kind of orange. You can see the lattice work there um, and the lines underneath where it sat on its on its shelves. Now the making of washed rind cheeses is fascinating. So you need, any, any cheese can be washed rind, but to get the gooiness and what you've got there, that kind of soft open texture, you need quite a lot of moisture in there. So we're looking at soft cheeses, cheeses with over 50%, well, maybe a bit less than that, but over 46, over 50% water. Now in making washed rind cheeses, you have a problem. You need bacteria, lots of it, famously Brevi bacterium linens, but we'll come on to that. You need bacteria. So although we call these cheeses washed rind cheeses, in real terms, 
they are bacteria ripened. Like if mold ripened, we're going to like love, love our mold ripened, maybe even yeast ripened to make our camemberts or our Celsius shares and all that malarkey. But the other option is to get some bacteria into the job. Bacteria flop onto the cheese, grow. Lots of funky stuff happening there. I feel like a bit David Bellamy here, I'm going to be honest. Uh, and uh, the cultures release those enzymes into the cheese and start breaking it down and making it this nice and squidgy. Oh, can we see squidginess? There? Oh, that's good, squidgy. Got now, nah, so it's nice and squidgy. Not uniformly squidgy, because as you'll know, you famous well known cheese people, this all comes in from the edge. So the bacteria on the edge are doing the action, which is why we've got that kind of extra squidgy top at the top there. And the center is going to be a little firmer because it takes more to get those enzymes into the body of the cheese. Now you're also gonna get with these washed rind cheeses and we can see it nicely here, little gaps opening up, right? The holes. Now, holes come from bacteria or, 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 or some other things, but mostly bacteria kicking off and making, um, uh, making, making air like bread you know like beer all that stuff and it makes these oh the smell is so fantastic and it makes the cheese open up slightly in this way right so Milene. now my brief my brief tells me it should have a deep pungent deep pungency with cooked veg and yogurt so let's go and find out now has anybody else game got Milene out there quinlan steel or oh, hang on a second you 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 quinlan's on uh, I'm gonna see this, 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 this gentleman here. Where are you? Where are you? Yeah. Uh, so uh, show my. So hi, Quinlan. He, this gentleman makes this, right? Okay. Famously, uh, down in. I'm gonna mispronounce the place where your where your farm is. Iris, 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 on the Bira Peninsula. I think we need a map. We'll have a map in a second. Um, but this is fantastic. And Maline is thought to be, or considered to be, the first modern Irish cheese. Um, oh, that was really naughty. Um, uh, I'm confusing my cheeses. I'm eating Doris. Maline is over here. This cheese is telling me that we've got earthy sweet milk, soil, and hay. You get the sweet milk. I love that sweet milk. But it's a fermented sweet milk. And there is a fermentation of uh, grass. It's not quite grass and it's not, it's more fermentation of the, the hay, the dry fermentation. Mm -hmm. But the other thing you get with washed rind cheeses, and there's a, there's a room about this. The other thing you get with washed rind cheeses is offal and meats, sometimes pork. And with this particular one, I am getting that awfulness, which is delicious. Um, almost like a pate, a liver pate, that kind of thing. There's a lovely, there's a lovely Welsh cheese as a snake. Hmm. What you don't want is to blow your head off with too much of the mustiness, that kind of aggressive farmyard notes. Some people really like that, and I respect that. If you like the cheeses like that, that is awesome. But I find these, um, I like to be able to taste the butter, the cream, the, the, the full dairy element of it. And not actually consume. Mm, that is delicious. So, what do we know about Durus? Gefagil started making it in 1979 in Kumkin, and I think it's time we started looking at a map. So, uh, now, as I said, oh, look, there's our cheese board. Where on earth did that go? Come from? Marvelous. Um. Uh, so let's have a quick look, share screen. Let's stop that and bring on, come on, application, Chrome tab, stream. There we go. Okay. So that is the Bira Peninsula. So we're looking directly west there. Um, so we're looking out over flattish grounds, going down into the sea, um, and then the mountains behind. Now, if I can make the magic work, we'll have a look at see if we can get the map up. And that will give me the magic of, there we go. Do, 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 do. Right, so here's Ireland. Down the bottom here, in the foot of the koala, we have our three cheese makers. 
Can we see that? Most beautiful country. My wife has friends in Cork, and I can tell you that it's gorgeous as you look around here. So down the bottom, we've got Gabin. We've got Kunkin up here, which is the, uh, the Dura. So we're making this cheese here. And over here, we have got Eries. Now, these are three peninsulas, the Sheep's Head Peninsula, the, uh, the Miz, Miz, Miz Peninsula. Sounds good. Um, and uh, and the Bearer Peninsula. Now, these three ladies have all been making cheese since the since the 70s uh, with the, with with um, Jenna Ferguson making uh, the Gabine, making it since about 1980s. So we're really talking about the recreation of traditional farmhouse cheese in Ireland at the time. Let's get rid of you and go back to me. Now, let's look back. At Irish cheese making, um, there is very strong evidence that five to six thousand years ago, at the end of the Neolithic, beginning of the the, the Metal Ages, um, there were enclosed dairy farms. Now, a lot of this, because we think of beef as being the sort of premium product, was thought to be beef back then. But as people are re-examining the evidence, there's strong evidence that beef was not a very good use of cattle, not a very good use of pasture, and dairying was much more effective. And in fact, you can see that in, in, in Irish history, in the number of names, and I tried to write some down here, the extraordinary range of names, it's like the Eskimos and their thousand words for snow, the amount of dairy products, the Irish. So I'm going to apologise for abusing the Irish language here, but we've got Trementa, we've got Blathach, we've got Mulcan, Tanach, Fesha Grotta, Gruss, uh, dozens of different names for, and these are all versions of buttermilk and cheese and butter itself. They had different names, they still have different names for butter uh, at the lighter salter end of the spectrum or the heavy salter end of the spectrum so that it would keep for longer. And if you look at the, uh, the sort of foreigners who came to Ireland to describe it, there is so much talk about the gorgeousness of the Irish pastures. And one of the things that uh, this is, I love this one, Pliny the uh, Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, said uh, the Northern tribes. And to be fair, he was talking about everywhere from Ireland all the way over Germany. So a lot of the Northern tribes, he called us nations of barbarian butter eaters. I mean, I love that. The idea that I'm a barbarian butter eater, which I clearly am, uh, is fantastic. And if you look at this emerging, then cheese was at the heart of it, not just butter. Although by the 1700s, going out of Cork Harbour was so much butter. Cork was the leading export of butter going out of Ireland and it was going all the way around the world in the sort of 1700s. But interestingly, it all went a bit sideways from then on and the amount of cheese being produced declined and declined and declined. And what you saw was a kind of growing myth amongst the sort of the Irish farming folk that you couldn't make you couldn't make dairy products and you couldn't do beef on the same pastures, which is complete manure. But people believe what people believe. And it wasn't until um, uh, sort of the 1880s, 1890s, when cheese making began to re-emerge in Ireland as a force. And by 1960s, the dairying has become one of the major Irish uh, industries, industries, and it really delivers on the potential of those awesome green pastures those pastures and now Irish cheddar and all that kind of thing I mean they did suffer in the same way as the rest of the UK suffered um, uh, on, amongst our islands in that cheddar began to dominate big time um, it's such an easy recipe to make so robust lasts lots a long time um, still lots of flavor um, but it began to push out the smaller producers and, and that kind of thing um, and it wasn't until people like Veronica Steele of Moline, people like Jenna Ferguson of Gabine, people like Jeff Gill at Duras in the 1970s started rediscovering us and cheese making and made these acts of love that were going on down there so we tried Duras so Jeffa on it gorgeous I love the Marwal I love this this is a fantastic cheese I really like it and I'm, I'm there's some one of the things about no Eat cheese, Charlie, eat cheese. Okay, up to number two. We are going to Gabine, going back to our map. This is just north. Um, this is down south. Now, which peninsula was that one? I'm lost. Irish peninsulas. I'm sure you could get lost. Apparently, even, even against Irish roads, the roads down in this area are, th are thin and small and windy. So what we've got is a very simple washed rind on the Duras, what you might call an early washed rind, distinctly orange, very smelly, uh, very sort of nasal. And now... We've got 
at the other end of the wash drying spectrum. Now here with a gabine, this is an older gabine, we've got a really distinct bunch of molds growing up through the wash. Now, because of the color, this suggests that these molds and, um, and that are, are, are local, as in this is not a monoculture of, of pure penicillium um, candidum or anything like that, but it's robust, I mean, it's strong. I might even just cut a bit off there to show you what I've got, right? It's like a carpet. I'm not suggesting you can build a house with this stuff, but it's it's not like this, which is very, very sticky and, 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 and fragile. So, so let's get into our gubby. Mm. Ooh, I'm just going to pull it apart. I know that sounds a bit rash, but I love it. And it's interesting, when you pull it apart rather than cut it, you begin to see more of the structure of the curd. Can you see? Now, in some cheeses, bigger cheeses, hard cheeses, pressed cheeses, that kind of texture would be seen as a flaw. But this is not those cheeses. This is a young cheese, soft cheeses, a cheese with lots of water in it. So that open texture is exactly what we're looking for. Again, you've got that fermented milk. You've got that rich, buttery, dairy smell. But here we're getting a little bit more dusty, earth, earthy. Now, a question you're probably asking is, mm. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. I've, I've accidentally gone from to the opposite end of the spectrum here. So I've got the youth. I don't mean young in, 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 in like history. I mean, this is a young wash dried, and we need to talk about that. So now we've got an older wash dried, and this is just edging up into the moisture levels have gone right down. We're edging up towards almost like a, um, uh, I want to say um, like a, a crumbly cheese because it's got that dry, open, buttery texture, but then it comes round with the creaminess of the wash dried now. Do you eat the rind? Yeah, delicious, turns out. Mm. Now, washed rind is quite interesting on the rind because the, um, the calcium migrates from the center of the cheese and forms little crystals in the rind. Not always, and not all cheeses, but some cheeses you'll get that effect so that when you're tasting the edge, it's like it's crunchy. And it's nothing like the calcium crystals you're getting in the, um, the calcium lactate or th those kind of things you get in the center of cheddars or, 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 or um, uh, gouders or stuff like that. It's completely different. And there was a geologist who came across these little calcium crystals on the right and found that the only other place in the world where these calcium crystals were formed was in deep sea stalagmite things that were coming out of sea bottoms. Fascinating. Only other place where this thing was being called that and cheese. Cheese is special, we know this. Okay, so we've got this gabine. So here, the, the, the brief that I've been given is forest mushroom, milky, nutty. I, I definitely get in the forest mushroom. Mm, I love that. Milky. Well, there is a degree of milkiness to that. But it's more cheesy. It is more cheesy. It's not got that fresh lightness in them. Mm. Nutty. We're slightly distrustful of the word nutty. Nutty is often used in so many cheeses when actually it sort of loses its identity. It seems to approximate simply to mean... That is so good. Um, it's an approximate. Maybe I'm just hungry, but I'm still saying it's good. Approximate to mean just a savoury sweet combo. And when you think of nuttiness and you think this tastes nutty, just ask yourself, can you name the nut? Because if you can't, then maybe it's just sweet and savoury, which is an awesome combination. Um, but if you can't name the nut, then maybe nutty isn't the right word to use when you're thinking of. Um, and I'm not getting, I'm not getting much specific nut, but it is amazing. And the keeps on giving, keeps on giving. Mm. Right. So we've done, we've done, uh, we've looked at the Duras, we've looked at the Gabin oven, and last one we have. So let me just mention this. This is uh, raised with me, but this one was thought to be similar. The Gabin was similar to, to a Telegio. Now, do you think that that is similar to a Telegio? Now, to my mind, the answer is no. 
Now you can see that that rind has hints of telegio. In fact, the Penicillium rock 40 almost looks like it's beginning to dust the edge, although that could be just an illusion. Um, but that way that the telegio has that thick rind as well uh, is interesting. And it does have it, but they, but all these cheeses have that wonderful meatiness. Now the last one on our list is the Meline, which is the steels. Now they're on the Bearer Peninsula. Um, now they're talking like fermented hay. Now there is, some people would say that this echoes the Apoise. Now does it, does it not? Well, I'm not sure that I'd want to do this to an Apoise. It would probably collapse in my fingers. So, but you're seeing again, that distinctive orange color of the washed rind. And a little bit of dusting of mold on the top, which may be penicillium rock 40, which, you, which it might well be. It's been there for some time. Oh, look at that beauty. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that's the picture I want to sleep over. Cool stuff. Right. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Now, washed rinds are tricky, you know. Why are they tricky? Because the washing of the rind is an active process. Can we make you focus? So again, we've got the slight opening up of the holes. That's cool, as the bacteria kick out the carbon dioxide or whatever it is. Not so much, but this one is gooey. Let's see if we can get a proper squeeze on that. Oh, 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 can you see that? So it's got a real elasticity to it. Oh, love that. Right. Okay, need a bit of tissue in that second. Mm. This has got the nose. Here we are. That's really now. <laughs> I love this fact. This is one of my favorite facts today. Uh, quite a lot of favorite facts today. Like, did you know? Where's my where's my other favorite fact over here? That where's it gone? A lady called Medba, Meda, 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 Beba, Beba. Uh, she was queen of, uh, um, oh, I've lost my, lost my queen of Clona, Clonaca, Clonaca, you're going to, someone's going to correct me this, but she was killed by her nephew who threw a cheese at her, right? Put it in a sling, you know, one of those chaps like David and Glass, boink, killed by a flying cheese. Not this cheese, I'd like to stress, probably need quite a lot harder cheese, but that, Cheese goes right through Irish folklore like you wouldn't believe. Anyway, so back to the Mm. Bark is worse than its bite. Bite is buttercream. That's, that's exactly what it is, it's buttercream. Mm. We're beginning to get the grittiness in the rind I talked about, whether it's migrating calcium. Mm. And there's no, there's no fear in the rind. The rind is delicious. Mmm, that's really good. I'm getting flowers. The, it's, it's got hints of almost a cheddary note in that very, very small note. So we've got buttercream, cheddar, flowers, earth, meatiness. What's the meat? Um, It's almost like a stock. It's like a it's like a pork stock kind of flavour. So not the offal notes. It's all the. Um, that's really good. Oh, delicious, delicious. <sighs> right. Have I forgotten anything? Probably not. Um, right. So we have three fantastic. These these ladies are mates, right? They know each other. They've been doing it for nearly what forty something years. They're properly creating something special down there in Cork. And there's lots of other things. If you don't know cork, you should go. There's awesome cider down there, for instance, which goes very well with these cheeses. Um, and there's absolute beauty in the simple, direct from the soil, own herd or, or neighbor's herd into a cheese making production that is as far away from uh, um, industrialization as you can imagine. It's all love. It's all heart. It's all people doing it. I don't want to say without ambition, but that satisfaction of making a good thing well over your lifetime. And these cheeses really reflect that. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about things like, um, what's the word, uh, bacteria? Where do they come from? What do they do? I mean, one of the things I really love about this, for instance, uh, there's a lady whose name I've temporarily forgotten, but did an analysis of these cheeses and the bacteria 
that grows on the top of them. And they found a type of bacteria on this cheese, the Gabine, that was found nowhere else. They had to give it a name, the Gabinese bacteria. How cool is that? Um, so there's a lot of chat in cheese making circles that this is all about Brevi bacterium linens, which I'm no doubt those people who are in the know know about, but these things are cities with people with bacteria coming from all sorts of different places. And the research done suggests that around 60% of the bacteria on the surface of these cheeses. They don't know where it comes from. And it's not because they're all milk. They're coming from the surfaces of the cheese, of, of the people, of the animals, the teats, the human. And actually that, uh, there's a lovely phrase I came across here. Um, uh, this cheeses, uh, these cheeses are often said to smell of boys' feet, which is like, right, nice. But the French have a phrase, l'odeur de pied de Dieu, the smell of the feet of gods. Now, how cool is that? You know, the smell of the feet of gods. And it's just like, I, I think that, I just love that. It's my favorite, favorite awesome moment. So I would like to uh, say that if you don't know washed rind cheeses, find out, experiment. They're great. There's a huge family of awesome cheeses. And if you don't know Irish washed cheese, I think you need to get on a plane as soon as your country lets you go to court because it's happening down there and they've been doing it so long it's part of this part of their dna so um i'm going to begin to run up there and i hope that you've enjoyed this day of irish wash dry and cheese they are things of beauty and i'm going to eat them as much as i like um and i hope that you too have enjoyed them now I'm just going to check. There are no questions from Tracy that you'd like me to to uh, like me to come. Who doesn't love a good squeeze, Siobhan? So right. Uh, uh, from Avril, thank you very much, Avril, for arranging this. You got these through sent to me. Um, and uh, Board Beer, which is like the Irish Food Board, has sponsored the cheese. And thank you very much for Sheridan's for supply. If you don't know the Sheridan's, Kevin and Seamus, they're sort of big beasts is that a fair word of the irish cheese scene and they really know their onions and they you know they've written their book um and uh, what else have we got um boom 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 have you any tracy is there anything else you'd like me to to add before we wrap up mm -hmm. no fantastic really amazing they, i i hope you you will need to wash your hands <laughs> yeah I can lick them. I'm allowed. <laughs> lick and wash your hands. But yes, thank you very much um, to the to the the cheese people of Ireland for um, supporting this tonight and and bringing a little bit of those the the your views of the coast just look amazing. We just all want to go on holiday, please. Now mm -hmm. we probably can. I mean, they're going to let us go to Ireland almost before anywhere else. So why don't we have a cheese academy road trip? That is, that is something to think about. Yay. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm up for that. All but right. thank you everybody for joining. Yeah, pleasure. Lovely to see you all tonight. Um, we'll be back next week. We'll put what we're doing up on the board somewhere. Come and keep stay in touch and let's talk cheese next Tuesday.